Welcome to Variant, where we love comics more than I can't wait to see Deadpool 2. And speaking of Deadpool 2, it's right around the corner. So today, we're going to start looking at the characters making their big screen debut in the movie. With that in mind, the most popular character in the movie other than Deadpool is Cable. He's a super interesting character and was created right around the same time as Deadpool. So let's see what this time-traveling mutant is all about. Nathan Christopher Charles Summers, who later became known as Cable, first appeared in the Uncanny X-Men issue 201 in January of 1986. But he didn't appear as Cable until the New Mutants issue 87 in March of 1990. He was created by Chris Claremont, Louise Simonson, and Rob Liefeld. What I find interesting about his actual real-world creation is that Chris Claremont created Nathan Summers in 86 as I just mentioned. But it wasn't until 1990, four years later, when Simonson and Liefeld decided to link their time-traveling mercenary to Nathan Summers, revealing Cable to be the adult Nathan from the future. Great Scott. I know, so let's check out Cable's comic book origin and see how it happened. Nathan Summers is the son of Madeline Pryor and Scott Summers, better known as Cyclops. Madeline was Scott's first wife, who ended up being a clone of Jean Grey created by Mr. Sinister. He made her because he wanted to use their child as a weapon against Apocalypse, but once Madeline found out she was a clone, she went a bit cuckoo and screwed up his plans. To be more specific, she let herself get seduced by demons and then began to harness demonic power, so nothing too weird there. Anyway, her new hobby led to her wanting to use her new son, Baby Cable, as a sacrifice to open a portal between Earth and some kind of demon-filled limbo, so the demons could run rampant. But Cyclops and the X-Factor refused to let that happen, and they eventually defeat Madeline and save his son. We then see Scott holding his son tightly, as any good father does after his child is nearly sacrificed to Satan for the first time. And in that moment, Jean approaches him, and he admits to her that the only reason he married Madeline is because she reminded him so much of her. Which of course was Mr. Sinister's plan all along. Anyway, Scott and Jean try to keep Nathan safe, however, the key word there is try. You see, Apocalypse eventually found out about Mr. Sinister's plan for the boy and kidnaps little baby Nathan. He then took him to the Inhumans lunar base and infected him with a deadly techno-organic virus before X-Factor could save him. Ascani, a member of a sisterhood in the future that fights against Apocalypse, then shows up and tells Cyclops that baby Nathan was going to die from the TO virus, unless he let her take him 2,000 years into the future when they have the technological logical ability to save him. And at that point, what choice did Cyclops have? He could either watch his son die from the virus right in front of him, or trust Ascani to do what she said she was going to do, and at least have some kind of hope that his son was going to be okay. So not shockingly, he let her take him. Once she arrives in the future, Nathan is cloned in case he doesn't survive Ascani's treatment for the virus. But Apocalypse's people attack there also, and kidnap Nathan's clone, thinking he was the real Nathan. Ultimately, the plan was to make this Nathan a new vessel for Apocalypse's soul slash consciousness, as Apocalypse's body was once again becoming old and weak. So Apocalypse raised Nathan's clone as his heir and named him Strife, the Chaos Bringer, believing it was the original Nathan the whole time. As for the original Nathan, he survived the T.O. infection, and Mother Ascani then pulled Scott and Jean into the future as well to help raise their son under the new identities Red and Slim. They stayed with him for 12 years, and during that time they taught Nathan how to control and use his telekinetic powers, including how to stop the deadly T.O. virus from spreading with his telekinetic abilities. Well, after honing his powers, the real Nathan went on to defeat Apocalypse by breaking the bond between Apocalypse and his clone. But he wasn't satisfied by just defeating Apocalypse in the future, so Nathan set off to defeat Apocalypse in the past as well, taking on the name Cable. However, Cable's evil clone Strife found out about Nathan's plan and tries to stop Cable from killing Apocalypse in the present. So in order to fight off Strife and his army, the Mutant Liberation Front, Cable develops a little team you've probably never heard of, the X-Force. And that, my friends, leads us to some Cable story arcs. So everything I just mentioned from his origin and early years pretty much took place in either the X-Factor, Uncanny X-Men, or the Adventures of Cyclops and Phoenix series. However, Cable fought his evil clone and the Mutant Liberation Front in the New Mutants and X-Force titles. A bit later, Domino helped Cable reorganize the New Mutants into the ever-so-popular X-Force, causing the New Mutants title to end with issue 100 and sending Cable and the other characters from New Mutants over to X-Force 1 the following month. The X-Force series then gave us even more detail for Cable's backstory, revealing a few of the pieces I already covered, like him being from the future and that he had traveled to the past to prevent Apocalypse's rise to power. Then in 1992, the character was given a two-issue miniseries called Cable, Blood and Metal, 
The miniseries explored Cable and Stripe's ongoing war with each other, and how it affects the people that surround Cable. After Blood and Metal, which is the most 90s name ever by the way, Cable was given a self-titled ongoing series in 1993. In fact, issue 6 of this series is where it was confirmed that Nathan Summers is indeed the son of Cyclops and Madeline Pryor. His solo series ran for 107 issues, before being relaunched as Soldier X, but that only lasted 12 issues until August of 2003. After that, Marvel gave us Cable and Deadpool. The title mainly dealt with Cable wanting to make the world a better place, like turning his spaceship Grey Malkin into the floating utopian island of Providence. The first story arc of the title basically shows that Cable has learned to suppress his techno organic virus nearly effortlessly. This allows him to access almost all of his vast psionic powers. Because of this, he gains a power level similar to his Nate Grey counterpart from the Age of Apocalypse reality, and Cable tries to use his immense power to force the people of the world to live in peace. Then in 2010, during the storyline Second Coming, the techno-organic virus finally catches up to Cable when he has to focus all his power on holding open a time portal that allowed other members of the X-Force to escape from the future. And while Cable died a noble death, this is comic books, people. We all know that characters almost never stay dead. So Cable returned in Avengers X Sanction, which is the story that acted as a prelude slash lead-in to the Avengers vs. X-Men storyline. Next, in 2012, we got the Cable and the X-Force title. This version of X-Force originally consisted of Cable, Colossus, Dr. Nemesis, Domino, and Forge and the series as a whole focused on eliminating disasters based on a group of mysterious visions Cable was having. Then in 2014, we would get yet another X-Force book by writer Simon Spurrier. The team of Cable, Silox, Phantom X, and Mero races Volga through the Brazilian jungle and battles France's superhuman Black Ops team. And finally, our most current Cable has his own ongoing series, written by Lonnie Nadler. I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I personally haven't read it yet, but I've heard good things. Now how about some powers and abilities? Cable has had a number of powers and abilities over the years, and they've changed quite a bit during that time. But let's run through them, starting with the most obvious, his ability to travel through time. This ability is of course a huge part of Cable's overall story and allows him to alter things significantly should he choose to. Then he has his bionic left arm and shoulder, which gives him enhanced strength allowing him to lift around 10 tons. He also can shoot a laser from his left cybernetic eye. And the laser is so strong it could shoot down a jet. Cable's also a telepath, which grants him telepathic illusion, mind link, telepathic cloak, mind control, mind trap, mind alteration, psionic blast, astral projection, mental detection, mind possession, mind transferal, and he has precognition abilities. But it doesn't end there. His telekinesis enables him to manipulate matter with the energy of his thoughts. For example, at his peak strength, Cable could extinguish a star with less than a conscious effort. His telekinesis abilities also allow him to create force fields, concussive blasts, and give him telekinetic flight. He's had several other abilities over the years, but the point is, he's a telepathic, telekinetic, time-traveling mutant you don't want to mess with. Now this episode is a good overview of Cable, but if you really want to dive into the character's story, pick up Uncanny X-Men issue 201, Cable and Deadpool Ultimate Collection Book 1, Cable and the New Mutants Trade Paperback, X-Force Omnibus Volume 1, Cable Classic Volume 1, Cable Classic Volume 2, and Cable and X-Force Classic Volume 1. That should be enough to get you guys started. First up for Wednesday, May 9th, we have Hunt for Wolverine Adamantium Agenda Issue 1. Due to a promise made between heroes, the new Avengers have reassembled to make sure Logan's body isn't misused. Here we have Domino Issue 2, Marvel's number one soldier of fortune's luck has finally gone south, turning her life as a mercenary upside down. Next we have Flash Issue 46, Wally West is overwhelmed by fragments from his past. With his protege psyche falling apart, Barry Allen races around the DCU, calling in every favor possible to save his shattered family. Now we have Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps, issue 44. The Dark Stars draw a line in the sand and tell the Green Lantern Corps not to cross it, but Hal Jordan never toes the line. And finally, we have Justice League No Justice, issue 1. Spinning out of the events of Dark Knight's Metal, this four-issue miniseries will set the stage for a whole new line of Justice League books. The only question is, what threat could be big enough to have heroes and villains team up? And that's going to do it for another episode of Variant, but remember, all the links for our social media is in the description below, like our Instagram, our Twitter, our Facebook, and our website. And if you liked the episode, be sure to subscribe and then hit the bell next to it so you're notified whenever we upload a new video. But I'll see you guys next time when I talk about all things comics.